Good morning, everybody. Okay, so Nate normally talks for like 40 minutes. I have 15, okay? So we have to be on schedule. Okay, quick recap. I'm still in Nehemiah. We're going to be talking through Nehemiah. My helpers, there they are, bringing my object for the object lesson. So in Nehemiah, we're learning, right? Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king. He left that country to come to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem, right? God called him out of that place into a place. Good job, boys. You want to just set it up? Stand it? Yeah. No, you're fine. Over there is wherever. And they rebuilt the wall. Who remembers how many days it took to rebuild the wall? Who said that? There it is, Mr. Hera. Okay, everyone, say it with me, 52. You're all paying attention. Okay, but, I mean, building a wall, you can, like, I built a wall around my, you know, garden the other day. It didn't take that long. Here's just a visual for you guys, away from the speaker, actually, or we're going to get some terrible feedback, everyone. This is a visual of how big this wall was, okay? I'm just going to yell for two seconds, guys, two seconds. Okay. the wall around Jerusalem. Guess how thick it was, guys. You toss a number. Eight feet. Wow, right off the bat. It was eight feet thick. Okay? So picture this, right? 40 feet high and eight feet thick. Here's a visual for eight feet. There's four, there's six, there's seven, here's eight. Okay? So it was about this thick from me to the ladder. 40 feet high, and the length of it, it was around one city, was two and a half miles. So that would be if you went out on this tree right here. Oh, let me get my microphone. Height, 40 feet, width, 8 feet, length, 2.5 miles. So if you went out on this tree right here, went all the way to Cathedral Oaks, and then went from Cathedral all the way to the next major street on the end, Went all the way down, past those Canaris, took High Real, all the way back, and back here. It was that big. So you think of this wall. It was not some tiny wall. It was a huge wall, 40 feet, all the way around this. It was incredible. And when we read the people, the response of the people, let me open up my Bible. That would be helpful, huh? It says that they were afraid when they saw that these people finished the wall because they realized this was a work of God. And it was. It was a miracle that they even finished this wall in time. And we're going to pick up in Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8. If everyone wants to open up there. I'm going to pull out my phone so I can time myself. We're on a schedule, tight schedule. Nehemiah chapter 8. If you're getting there, say getting there. If you got it, say got it. Open up those Bibles, everyone. If you don't open your Bible in church, what's the point? Duncan. I'm kidding. Okay. Nehemiah chapter 8. We open it up, and it kind of sets the stage for what's going on, right? The wall is completed. The enemies are more or less defeated. Tobiah and Sanballat, right? We learned about those guys. They're pestering them, trying to scourge them, trying to make them afraid. They aren't bothering them at this point. And everything seems to be going really well, right? And it says that they all met in front of this gate in Jerusalem. And Ezra, he was a scribe, he came up and he read the law. And when it says the law, it means the first five books of the Bible. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, right? Now, if you've ever read those books, it is not short. That is quite a long passage. And it says that they're there from daybreak. A little party over there. 
from daybreak until midday, which is six hours. So if you think Nate preaches long, this, man, this was brutal. Six hours, they're just sitting there listening, and it only says that they were listening. It says that they were attentive to the words that were spoken. These people were here because they wanted to learn. So right, this is, we're going to pick up in verse 9, if you want to read along. This is the scene, right? Everyone's there. They've just read the law for six hours. They're sitting there. And this is what happened. Verse 9. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra the priest and the scribes, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the Lord. Right? And it's kind of an interesting scene, right? The wall is just rebuilt. And their enemies aren't pestering them. And it seems like it should be a joyful time, right? But the people, when they hear the words that were read from the law, they actually wept. It's interesting. And this is why I think they wept. If you turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 through 17, and this is what it says. That all skip scripture is given by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, there's two things in that verse that explain why the people wept. It is that God's work reproves and God's works corrects. The tears that the people had were evidence, I'm just going to throw my notes when I'm done, were evidence that God's word was having an effect in the people. They heard the word and say, dude, I am not following this. I am not doing this. And it actually broke the people's hearts. Now, conviction of sin is a good thing in our lives, but if the only thing you feel when you read scripture is guilt, there's something wrong. And Nehemiah saw this in the people, and this was his response in verse 10. It says, Then he, uh, Nehemiah, said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to the Lord our God. Do not sorrow, for the Lord your God is your strength. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Excuse me. And Nehemiah here is realigning their focus. When they read the words, when they heard the words in the Bible, all they saw in it was themselves. They said, dude, I don't measure up to this. I'm not good enough for this. I fell short of that. And when they were reading it, they never found joy in it because they only saw themselves in the law. Now, if we as Christians read the Bible and we're thinking, how does this, what does this mean about me? What does this show me of? If you read the story of David and Goliath and then you think, oh, I have to go slay my own giants now. Or if you read the story of Noah and you think, okay, now I have to go build an ark to save myself. Or if you read the story of John the Baptist and think, oh, okay, I have to prepare a way for people to hear Jesus. Dude, you're missing the point of scripture because we are not the heroes of the Bible believe it or not. Wow, shocker, yeah? The point of the Bible is that it is pointing to Jesus. And Nehemiah here is pointing out that their strength does not come from doing something for God, but rather spending time with God. And as we spend time with God, we realize when we read the story of David and Goliath, we aren't David going out and slaying the giants. We're the Israelites who are too scared to do it. And Jesus is that man who goes out and fights our battles for us. And if we think we read the story of Noah. We don't see ourselves as the hero, but rather we are the people fleeing into the ark, Jesus Christ, who raises us up above the flood that wipes out the rest of the world. And as you read John the Baptist, you don't think, okay, now I have to go prepare a way for the people. Because what does Jesus say? I am the way for the people. And as you read scripture, and if you only see yourself in it, you're always going to leave feeling guilty, thinking, man, I don't measure up. I'm not good enough, but here's the point. God is saying, dude, it is not about you. It is about my son. As you read this scripture and you point out Jesus, you say, dude, Jesus is the one that saved me. Jesus is the one that redeems me. Jesus is the one that brings me protection. It does not bring sorrow any longer, but rather the word of God brings joy to us, right? That we, as we enter into this relationship with Jesus Christ, we are no longer the one doing all the work. Um, my brother actually mentioned this story in one of his teachings a while ago. And when I was growing up, I was on this soccer team, and my team was awful. We, we just were so, so bad. And I was the kid that's, like, sitting on the grass looking at the late dandelions, 
like, Mom, I found a bug. Look. You know, I just did nothing. But the thing was, on my team, there was this one kid who was so, so good. And even though literally all of us were terrible, we won every single game because this one kid on the soccer team was so good. He would just run out and like everyone's like, you know, five-year-olds playing soccer, there's like 20 of them in the corner and the ball is somewhere in there and it flies out eventually and then everyone runs after the ball again, you know? It's not a sport, it's just like follows the leader essentially. But this one kid, he was just running circles around everyone. He was so good. And because of that one kid, my team won every single game. Not because we were any good by any means, but because that one kid was so, so, so good. And it is the same thing in our relationship with Jesus Christ. We have joined the team of Jesus when we choose to be identified with him as Christians. And it's not that we are any good at anything, but there's one person on our team who is so good that we win every single fight, that we win every single battle. And it's just, uh, Ryler brought that up, and I was like, that is the perfect picture of Christianity. It's like, we're all just like standing there, and Jesus is just doing everything. And because that one kid was so good, I got to enjoy the victory of my team winning. Not that I did anything, but I got to enjoy the benefits of winning because that one person was so good. And it's the same way with Jesus. We get to enjoy the victory and the blessings of being a victor with Jesus, not because we did anything, but because he did it all for us. And that, I just, it was like the perfect analogy. Ryler Austin, preacher. We're continuing on now in verse 11. It says, so the Levites quieted all the people saying, be still for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to rejoice greatly because they understood the words that were declared to them. The people were now freed up to enjoy the blessings that God had given them. And it wasn't because the wall was complete. It wasn't because they started doing all the right things. But what does it say? It says the people rejoiced because what? They understood the words that were spoken to them. And this is exactly what I'm talking about. If we understand the words that were spoken to them, you know what we can do? We can go out and rejoice. We don't have to mourn. We don't have to grieve. But when we understand the words that God speaks to us, we go out and rejoice and live the life he's called us to live. If you want to turn to John chapter 6, I'm going to turn there real quick. There's a bunch of coins up here. It's like, what are these from? (laughs) John chapter 6. I'm turning there. I'm turning there. Getting there. Getting there. Got it. Okay. This has to do with before. If we think we are the point of the Bible, the the Bible is a tool that God just uses to tell us what to do and give us a bunch of rules to live by, you're missing the point. Because when the people asked Jesus, they said, what do we do that we may do the works of God? This was Jesus' response in John chapter 6, verse 29. Jesus said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. And again, later on, verse 39 it says this is the will of the father who sent me that all he has given me i should not lose but i should raise them up in the last day and this is the will of him who sent me that everyone who sees the son and believes in him may have everlasting life and i will raise him up in the last day and this is the point of god's scripture to us god's pointing it and says hey you know what my will is And it's not that you live a perfect life and do everything right. My son did that for you. You know what my will is? Is that you would look to Jesus and be saved. I think two times in there, it's it's incredible. That says, the will of the Father, what is it to do? That he should raise us up. It says that in verse 39. And again in chapter 40, that he should raise us up. And again in 44, and I will raise him up in the last day. The will of the Father is that he should raise us up. It is not that he expects us to do anything, that he's laying out all these rules for us to follow so that we might be good Christians, but God's heart and his will through the Bible is that he should raise us up. And it's that whole purpose, the whole picture of that kid with the soccer team, right? He didn't become some perfect human being so that he says, okay, your turn, buddy, you know? Dude, he lived it so that we could enjoy the blessings of being on his team. As we look and point to Jesus Christ, we see 
hey, you know what? He has done everything for me. I now just get to live and walk and breathe in the freedom that he has given me in Christ. That's incredible. Oops, wrong page. Sorry, guys. I don't, I'm not used to having so many notes. It's just more like an object lesson, then boom, done. Now there's so many, right? God's will in Scripture is to raise us up, right? It's good that sin convicts us and corrects us because we're coming, being conformed to the image of Christ day by day. But I, I came across this quote by David Guzik, and I thought this went really well. It says, If the sense of conviction is greater than the sense that God is doing a good and holy thing, then tears are not good. Our knowledge of sin should never be bigger than our knowledge of Jesus as our Savior. We are great sinners, but he is a greater Savior. And if you read scripture and get caught up in all the things that you are falling short on, you miss the benefit of seeing Jesus Christ through the scriptures. That as you open it up, you say, man, God has redeemed me through this book. And this is just a story of how he's done it. He's raised me up in the last day. And as we read it, the Bible is always, always about Jesus, but it is always, always for you. Because as we read his word, and are just infatuated by and see, man, Jesus, and we look our eyes and raise them to Jesus, you know what, he is always reaching his hand down to us. And everything that is about Jesus, all the great things he's done, all the ways he has redeemed us, it is actually for our benefit. That he's saying, dude, I came to raise you up. That You don't have to live in guilt and shame and fear anymore, but I've come that you may have life and life, what? Abundantly, right? An awesome, full, incredible, incredible life. And that's what I saw in this passage, that Nehemiah says, dude, hey, don't sorrow. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Our strength does not come from being the perfect people, from trying to fulfill and check off all the boxes for God. Our strength comes from Jesus Christ and being in his presence. And by doing that, dude, he makes us into the people that we are called to be. So I'm going to pray for us. Wrap it up. It was a short one today, guys. Told you. Kept it under. Kept it under 15 minutes. We're going to pray, guys. Here we go. Thank you, Lord, that you have redeemed us, Jesus, that there is no longer anything for us to do, Jesus. But we look to you and say, hey, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I don't have to worry if I'm going to fall short and God's going to punish me. But Jesus took the punishment for my sin. And now, hey, he's here to raise me up to be with him. That I get to enjoy the victory that you won, Jesus, because you emptied yourself you gave everything up so that I might gain everything, Jesus. Thank you for that incredible, incredible truth, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Help that reality to be evident in our daily lives, Jesus, that we live as redeemed people, not working towards victory, but working from a place of victory because of what you've done for us, Jesus. So we love you, Lord, and pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ranger Rhett. Let's give it up, Ranger. Appreciate that. I love that word. The Bible's not about you. The Bible's about Jesus. And when we see that focus, joy and rejoicing happens. Well, I wanted to close in this uh, one way. We thought what an opportunity it is today to give an invitation for anyone here to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We read scripture that Jesus had such a heart for children. When the disciples were keeping kids back from Jesus, the, Jesus would say, hey, hey, no, no, no. Let the children come to me. And so as the band's getting ready for our last song, I just wanted to give an invitation, and this is how I want to do it. Does anybody, anybody, everybody have a hand here today? Does everybody have hands? Usually you bring your hands with you wherever you go. And the hand is a great way to think about the gospel. And I want to see, let's just do it this way. Can everyone give me a, a thumbs up? A thumbs up. We think about our thumbs up sign. It reminds us that God is good. <laughs> Amen. God is good. He loves you so much. Think about our thumb. We think about a thumb print. We realize that God made us uniquely and individually. And he cares so much about you. God is good. How about, let me see your pointer finger. Pointer finger. Uh, usually when we use our pointer finger, we're pointing something out in someone, right? The pointer finger reminds us that although God is good, but the fact of the matter is, is that the Bible tells us that we are sinners, We've been pointed out. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
We read that sin is anything that we say or think or do that displeases God. Our words we say or the actions that we behave in, the way we treat our parents, the way we treat other people, God recognizes that and sin is, it separates us from God. And then hold your hand out like this. What's the, the tallest finger is the middle finger. Well, the middle finger reminds us that the greatest answer to man's deepest need is that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever would believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The middle finger reminds us that Christ died for us. The greatest answer to our biggest need. And the, third, uh, the fourth finger is the ring finger. Thinks about an invitation of relationship. And Jesus says, whosoever believes in me. There's an invitation to receive this love of God. This gift of salvation, it's an invitation for free for us to receive. And the pinky, the smallest finger, the pinky reminds us that really we just have to have a little bit of faith to receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, to believe that he is who he says he is, he's did what he said he did, and we receive everlasting life. Isn't that a sweet way to think about the gospel this morning, friends? God is good. He loves you so much. But there's sin that separates us from him. But not, don't fret because the answer to man's greatest need is Jesus left heaven and came to earth so we could leave earth and go to heaven. And all it takes is an invitation. Jesus says, whosoever believes in me, whoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And it just takes a little bit of faith to receive that. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never placed saving faith in Jesus Christ. No matter what age you are, young, old, today could be your day. So we, can we just close in a holy moment here? And I want to just pray for us and pray for you. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Uh, Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity we've had today to come in the house of the Lord. We love that church is fun. That's why I love being a part of Anthem Chapel. This is fun. It's a great place to be. Life with Jesus is an adventure. I want to be a ranger for Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we thank you for those that are here today. Some that are back maybe for the first time. Maybe some that are in, were invited by neighbors or friends. Lord, in this moment, I pray you would have your way here. As every head is bowed and eye is closed and we're in this attitude of prayer, maybe you're here today and for the first time you want to place Jesus, receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Maybe today, for the first time, you recognize that God does love you, but that there's things that you've done or said that displease God and separate you from him, and you want to receive the free gift that Jesus gives you. Maybe today is your first day, and you want to receive Jesus. As every head is bowed and eye is closed, if that's you here today, would you just raise your hand and say, yeah, Pastor Nate, that's me. I, I do want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I do want to place faith in him. I do want to receive what he's done for me. As every head is bowed and eye is closed, anyone here this morning says, yeah, that's me. Would you pray for me? I want to receive Jesus today. Yeah, amen. In this moment, holy moment, amen. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> See, Father, we thank you for these here this morning. We thank you that there is a free gift offered to us, way better than right now media, a free gift of salvation. And for those hearts here that for the first time want to place faith in you, Lord, we thank you for those here. We thank you, Lord, that simply we just pray a prayer that goes like this. If this is you here today and you want to receive Jesus as your Savior, just repeat this prayer in the quietness of your heart. Dear Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died and rose again. Forgive me of my sin and come into my heart. You are my Jesus, my King, my Lord. And all God's people said this morning, amen, amen. Would you stand up with me this morning as we close on a beautiful song? I think it's Stand in Your Love, right? Stand in Your Love. Thank you for joining us this morning. What a great day it has been. If that's you here today and you want to know more about Jesus, come see me or any of the, the uh, leaders here. We're wearing these ranger vests. We'd love to introduce you to Jesus. If you are here this morning and we pray that prayer to receive Jesus, come talk to us. We want to get a Bible in your hand and come alongside your journey with Jesus. So.